Okay, Gordon, this is your time. Uh, we are very happy to continue our conversation and lesson about the environment, English for the environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there are some news for the participants. The first one is that, well, we will work a little bit in the second part of the training course on uh, syllabus, microlanguage, how to write a blog, how to write an article in English concerning the environment and uh, pollution issues and so on. And uh, I will also have some more uh, meetings concerning how to log in into the website and platform and how to write a post into WordPress blog. And so you'll be invited to follow also my course. And there is another news. I give you the floor, <laughs> Gordon. So. Okay. Um, okay. So I tell you, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'll mention this now, but I'll also mention it towards the end because I realise that maybe some people are still uh, are still joining <coughs> still joining the meeting. Um, so the idea is that probably in the week of the. 7th or 8th of June, either the Monday or the Tuesday, um, I'm going to run a, I'm proposing to run a webinar uh, which is based on the Climate Interactive uh, En-ROADS uh, Climate Simulator. Um, now it sounds a bit scary but it's not and I really really feel the need to communicate this so um, there will be more information forthcoming uh, in, the next, uh, in the next few days we'll send an email around with more details but uh, for anyone who doesn't know it um, the Climate Interactive uh, group is a group based in MIT in the US um, and <clears throat> it's a group which is focused on, uh, let's say, communication and providing tools for the debate around climate change, but above all, uh, around the debate about the sorts of actions that people can take, I think. And I think it's very important because it's... It's the sort of, uh, let's say, it's the sort of tool which helps the discussion uh, because the situation obviously is pretty complex. So um, my, um, uh, my, let's say, my proposal is to do a, a webinar two hour, just like a two hour session like this on that subject. Um, to introduce people to the climate interactive uh, materials and the simulator and to uh, let's say help people get started on um, thinking about this stuff in a uh, let's say a, sci a scientific way in the sense of it's a debate which is something which helps the discussion okay okay so, I, if I can add a little little bit more about my opinion about it and um, I checked the tool it's wonderful it's really incredible and it's something that should be uh, well used by every teacher and only participating to this you you can get aware of uh, an interaction of the systems into not only the climate but all the circle of life on the planet and this is amazing very useful mm. at educational level I've been asking to Gordon to get in touch the, to the MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of the greatest universities in the world, in order to make a connection between our school plastic free network and them through this tool. And make this tool like a, a, a section of our uh, school plastic free network um, strategies. So this is uh, really something that uh, Gordon, I, I thank you Gordon for this wonderful news and mm -hmm. I think you'll be very happy uh, to implement this tool in uh, all our projects activities. Yeah, I, th 
Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks, Stefan. As, as I say, the idea of where I'm coming from is that um, I know that there is a lot of debate and there's a lot of uh, uh, difficulty when you're faced with something which is very unfamiliar. Um, and underneath the tool, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff, okay, but you don't have to know about second order differential mathematics to be able to use the thing. And what's more is um, it's not just a toy. It is a real piece of, let's say, research machinery. So um, so this is something which I'm, I'm going to introduce it to you because I want to, I really feel that we need to know about this stuff. Okay, so uh, um, Stefan, I'll just bring your attention to the chat. Someone says there's no, no, no today's date in the registration form, so I don't know whether you can sort that out. So um, if everyone is okay, um, I would like to, I'd like to make a start. Um, again, please leave comments on the chat as, as usual. Um, now today, we've got, I've got uh, two things. Um, excuse me. Um, let me just sh share my screen. Share, da, 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 what am I sharing? I'm sharing my screen desktop. There we go. No, not the desktop. I'm sharing this one. There we go. Not that one, not that one, not that one. Okay, that should that should go. So I'm gonna start sharing this. Allow access. Hmm. Oh, who knows what's happened there? And here we go. Right. Okay, so here we are. Um I can see Stefano up in the <laughs> in the corner there. Um which is a bit weird, but anyway. Okay, so um where we got to last time, where we got to last time, we were start. We were talking about um, ecosystems, and I was sort of going through uh, different uh, different characteristics uh, of ecosystems and different types of ecosystems and what have you. Um, what what we're going to do today is I'm going to finish that section, and then I'm going to introduce. Um, uh, a little exercise which is to get you thinking. Um, it's, a, it's an exercise which I think you can um, you can reflect on uh, over the summer. So um, I would ask you now, if you don't have it, um, if you have a piece of paper, A4 is good, A3 is better, okay, and a pencil um, for the second part of the session today, that would be um, very, uh, I think it would be very useful, okay? And I'll, I'll tell you more about it when we get there, so don't, don't worry too much. Okay, so last time we were talking about, um, we were talking about uh, different characteristics of, uh, of ecosystems, and we started to talk about adaptation, um, which is that, um, Ecosystems are constantly uh, are constantly evolving, and they they have this um, uh, this series of interactions. It's not just a simple case of who is eating whom and what is eating what. Uh, it's it's a bit more complicated than that. And some of the interrelationships are easy to see. Some of them are quite hidden. Uh, ecosystems can be uh, different levels of, of complexity. Um, but one of the things that they all have in common is that they are dynamic. Now, some are more dynamic than others. Um, so in some cases, we may think about um, isolated ecosystems, typically um, islands which are not easily reached. So uh, islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, for example, or, uh, for example, cave systems. Um, and so these are the sorts of systems that tend to sort of take off, uh, take off on a particular adapt course of adaptation, um, which is particularly suited to those environmental conditions. But of course, part of the dynamicity, uh, the dynamic nature of the system is that um, if there are 
uh, outside forces which change the conditions, then of course the system has to, the ecosystem has to, uh, has to react to this in order to, uh, in order to survive. In, in the sense that the animals and the plants and the organisms within the ecosystem will react to the conditions that you uh, that, 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 that they find and in some cases they're not able to uh, adapt in some cases they're able to adapt really, really rather well okay so um, I've got some camel actually the drom dromedaries are not really camels the dromedaries um, which are quite clearly uh, extremely adapted uh, uniquely exquisitely adapted to uh, Des desert environments where the key uh, the key factors are obviously um, lack of water and extreme heat. Uh, there are other uh, other examples. I think I may have shown a, a picture of an ant, which is uh, the silver ant, the Saharan silver ant, which uh, is also adapted to um, extreme uh, extremes of heat. So. Okay, so we've got uh, some systems are ecosystems are relatively simple. Um, so if we look at the the Arctic or the Antarctic systems, um, which are in their own way, the Antarctic in particular is is quite isolated. It's a, it's it is a continent, but it is uh, essentially a big island at the bottom of the world, and it is surrounded completely by sea. It's surrounded by the Southern Ocean, so. Uh, that is quite an isolated, uh, an isolated system, um, but they, they tend to be rather simple. Whereas, if we think about the tropical rainforest, um, and a rain, not even a tropical rainforest, a rainforest, for example, on the west coast of the U.S. and Canada, uh, they are also classed as rainforests. They have an incredibly, uh, an incredibly dense. Um, network of interactions between um, many many organisms which uh, which live in the different parts of the of the forest so for example we could see you could imagine that the organisms that are living down here uh, in the undergrowth are a little bit different to the ones that are living on the trunk and they're going to be very different to the ones that are living in the canopy so we've got uh, we've got massive variation and it's always always evolving the the changes that are occurring here now we know that changes are occurring here because uh, because of, of, of global warming um, but under normal conditions let's take the clock <laughs> a few hundred years a few hundred years back um, the Arctic system would be relatively stable relatively constant and it's changing but relatively slowly Okay, so thinking about isolation, uh, I mentioned caves. Uh, caves are a particularly fascinating, um, uh, fascinating uh, area, fascinating uh, set of um, uh, habitats because uh, one of the first things is there's no light. So if there's no light, there's no uh, there's no photosynthesis, and there is no um, uh, there's no source of uh, there's no source of, of of food from primary producers. Um, so th what what tends to happen in caves is you tend to have um, organisms which develop to have very very low meta metabolic rates. In other words, they have relatively little to eat, and what they do eat they make it last a long long time. Um, the energy so energy getting energy from anything is extremely uh, extremely difficult um, and so all of the let's say uh, all of the the, the sort of the, the the dynamics the quick dynamics that you see you would see in a rainforest um, uh, in a cave system these these types of reactions are very very much uh, very much slower um, so, I mean, here we've got a, I can't remember what this, this one is, I think it's called a cave salamander, I'm not sure, but it's, uh, it's a particular species which uh, over time, you don't need, there's no light, you don't need color, you don't need eyes, um, so you develop, uh, you develop and enhance uh, different, um, uh, different sensors, 
which uh, so you're sensing maybe vibration uh, or smell, and uh, these are typically these are typical ad um, adaptations for for life in a in a cave. Um, okay, so this is thinking about isolated systems. Um, and some isolated systems are bigger than others. Australia is another good example of, a, of an isolated system. It has a unique, um, a unique set of marsupial uh, fauna, which um, were not, uh, which were, have been isolated for such a long time that essentially all of the niches, all of those jobs, those roles within the ecosystem that you would find. Uh, in an African savanna, on an African savanna, or in in an Indian jungle, you find them in in Australia as well. But it's different animals that are doing the job. Okay, so so one of the things, one of the problems, uh, and this is linked to several um, uh, several things, uh, is the problem of inv invasive species. Now um, you can see here there is a picture of <coughs> a snake skin. This is actually a python, um, which are uh, potentially um, in some places in the world um, very important invasive species. Um, so I'm just going to give a couple of examples because there are quite a lot of examples of these. Um, but if we look at um, uh, if we look at, let's say, the general situation, when you have uh, an ecosystem that is sort of in balance, um, you have a, uh, let's say, a, a sort of an equilibrium between prey and predators and the primary producers and the secondary uh, secondary consumers. And, and so the thing is sort of working a bit like a machine within uh, within the usual, let's say, confines of the of the of the climate uh, conditions, um, when you introduce something uh, which is not normally present in that uh, in that environment, um, that can really cause problems, and in particular, if if the uh, if the so-called invader invade invasive species, excuse me. So the uh, the invader is um, uh, either an aggressive um, animal, so that it's uh, it's it's well able to uh, let's say make its mark in the territory. Uh, whether it has uh, if it has predators within let's say that ecosystem, because quite often what happens is. Uh, as is as is the case of a python, um, you've introduced something which has no natural predators in uh, in that particular system, um, or you may have something which is able to outcompete the uh, organisms that are already there. And so, for example, some some types of plant. Uh, I'm thinking of things like Japanese knotweed. Which um, is having, which is causing great problems in Holland, because it's a it's a type of um, it's a type of weed uh, pondweed which lives in the canals and which is able to uh, spread very very rapidly, but it has root systems which are able to break concrete. So it's 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 a real it's a real uh, a real problem, and so you also then get the question of well how do you control this? And there are many cautionary tales out there, but just looking at well so sorry, sorry just to mention the python, it's in Florida. Where do pythons come from in Florida? Well, they come from people keeping them at home, and then they realise that that cute little serpent that they bought. And it was like well, 15, 20 centimeters long. Um, when it gets to be two meters, maybe it's not a great idea to have it around the house. So they get rid of it by releasing it into the wild. Pythons are so aggressive that they will even even hunt alligators. So um, that's just. But coming to less spectacular examples, we have things like um, the hedgehog. The European hedgehog, which is uh, a fairly cute animal, it's uh, it's a rapacious insectivore. 
um, but it is pretty cute. Um, and some homesick uh, farmers and uh, citizens in New Zealand decided to introduce it to their gardens because it made them feel more like at home. Um, the problem is the hedgehog is destroying many of the, uh, it's completely upsetting many of the local uh, habitats because, um, uh, and this is also something, uh, something which is um, worth reflecting on, um, we tend to know a lot about maybe the animals, the bigger animals, but we tend to know very little about what happens under the ground and, and the insects and stuff, apart from the fact that insects are pretty yucky for most people. Um, so we tend to not really give that part too much, uh, too much attention. But of course, they are the sorts of animals which are uh, key, um, key food sources, but also key predators for uh, a whole set of um, agriculturally important pests, but also um, uh, animals uh, animals around the place. So, for example, a hedgehog is uh, decimating some uh, particular insects which are only found in New Zealand, and these insects are cornerstone species within the within the the uh, the, net, the the ecosystem network. Um, <clears throat> coming to an example which I know uh, I know better because of the uh, because I grew up in the UK. Grey squirrels. Grey squirrels are cute, but grey squirrel the, the grey squirrel is not the natural squirrel in the UK. The natural squirrel in the UK is red. Um, grey squirrels are American. They're North American. They're a bit bigger and they're much much more aggressive. Um, you only have to sit for a few minutes in any park in London, and you will have these things. Um, taking stuff out of your pockets. They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty forward and pretty aggressive. Um, plants, we have uh, this, uh, this thing uh, called the giant hogweed, which is quite a nice ornamental plant. And in fact, that's why it was introduced as an orma ornamental plant. Um, you get big flowers, they grow over <coughs> stalks, which are over two meters long. Um, quite spectacular, actually. The problem is it's quite toxic, quite poisonous to grazing animals, um, and it's extremely invasive. It spreads very, very quickly, and it basically smothers uh, local, um, local plants. And then, uh, last of all, we've got this, uh, we've got this pretty guy here. Um, this is a, a cane toad, uh, and this is one of the big cautionary tales of um, uh, biological control which went out of control. So uh, there is a uh, the, the sugarcane industry in Australia is very important. Historically, is very important in the early 20th century. Um, and in the 1920s, 1930s, there were problems with uh, insects, which were destroying basically insect pests, which were destroying uh, the sugarcane. Um, so people looked around and they saw that in South America there's this big toad, which is called a cane toad, which in South America eats these insects and it eats the pests and so it keeps the uh, it keeps the sugar the sugar cane harvest protected, let's say. So they said, well let's introduce these to Australia. They introduced them to Australia <clears throat> and of course uh, the, the toad found other things to eat. It wasn't interested in the insects because there were there were other uh, there were other creatures which were far easier to catch, and so uh, there was an explosion in the uh, population of the cane toads. Um, if that weren't bad enough, these things are huge. They're enormous and they're poisonous. Um, you you can you can get some pretty bad effects if you pick them up without uh, gloves. Okay. Um, nothing, there are no predators in Australia, there are no large carnivores, and even if they were, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have resistance to the poison that the, uh, the toad produces. So, uh, this is a, uh, this is a, a, a cautionary example of, uh, a cautionary tale about, um, managing one invasive species, man managing uh, a, a biological problem with uh, an invasive species. Okay, so 
Okay, so we talked, we've talked about ecosystems, so we have this idea of different places in the world have different, uh, uh, different things, different makeups, of course, and this will, of course, depend on the latitude, and this will influence the amount of sunlight, uh, the length of the day, uh, the stability of the climate, the regularity of the climate, okay? But in general, um, the, the uh, biologists have, or ecologists have divided the world up into different biomes and there are uh, several, uh, there are a number of these biomes which are described as the classic, let's say, large scale, uh, large scale communities that you um, that you find so you can see them sort of distributed on this on, on this the, this map here that you have uh, things like um, the high arctic this is the tundra you have the uh, the boreal forest which is also known as taiga uh, you have uh, high mountains which are typically along the cordilleras running around the pacific but also uh, in uh, central africa and also in um, uh, in the Himalayas, the north of, uh, and the whole, uh, and this, this area here. Um, you have deserts which are spread around in different places. So you have a set of different, let's say, large scale, um, uh, large scale uh, ecosystems, if you like. Uh, but within these, of course, locally you will have variations, and local ecosystems can be. Um, can be very, very, let's say, specialised versions of these these broader um, uh, these broader uh, biomes, let's say. So uh, that's the list. It's uh, I think most people know what uh, what these different things are. But let me just see if I can. Okay, yeah. So um, they are related to. Uh, the amount of water and the temperature, which is related to the climate, which is also related to the the latitude and the the fact that Earth is um, spinning on a on a um, on an axis which is not uh, not perpendicular to its orbit, but which is inclined. And so uh, we have the warm dry um, uh, the warm dry. Uh, uh, biomes such as the desert and the Mediterranean, the savanna, um, which give way to the when with more water available, you have tropical rainforest, rainforest, uh, temperate rainforest. Somewhere in between, you've got the prairie, which is a bit less uh, a bit less dry than uh, a savanna, and then you've got more specialist, uh, the more special. Um, uh, uh, biomes like the mountain biome which is actually adding the third dimension because it's to do with height so you have the uh, height above sea level so you have the um, <clears throat> you have the alpine uh, uh, the alpine flora and fauna which are very very particular um, and then of course we have the the high uh, the high latitude um, the high latitude uh, forests and uh, I, well, it's not a desert because it's wet, but the the, tu the Arctic tundra where um, you don't find trees because they're not able to uh, to take root, um, and then finally at the top you have the cold uh, the cold polar regions. So this is a sort of like a, a general summary of how the biomes are influenced by the amount of water and the temperature. Okay, now just to give you uh, this graph will be impossible for you guys to read probably um, but I think what you can see is you can see that this is a lot this this thing here this this bar here is is quite long um, this is basically the amount of mass about the amount of biomass that you have in a particular uh, particular biome Okay, so just to give uh, to give two sort of uh, two comparisons, this is a tropical rainforest. Um, so, if we're talking about um, if we're talking about <coughs> destruction of rainforests, we're talking just about um, erosion of a large amount of biomass, but also a large amount of biodiversity. Um, 
if you look at the, to the tundra or the, the taiga, which are the, at the, the bottom here, you can see that there is there are relatively um, they're relatively they're actually very small. Um, but this is also because they're very delicate systems. Uh, particularly the the Arctic is uh, it's well known that um, uh, something uh, something which takes a, a certain amount of time to grow at a at a, a lower latitude at a higher latitude so in other words further north will take longer to grow if it can grow at all and so you have a let's say a whole ecosystem which is a lot um, it's a lot smaller, it's a lot less, potentially a lot less resilient and so this is why we do have to be very careful about um, the, uh, the idea of uh, looking, looking to drill for oil etc in these pristine uh, Arctic environments. Okay, so you have the difference between um, a large amount of biomass with a lot of different species and a relatively small amount of biomass with a relatively small amount of species. Okay, okay, so um, we've got three, okay, so we've got different types, but thinking about what they actually consist of, we've got um, uh, three, uh, three broad, uh, broad, broad types, which are the um, freshwater, the terrestrial and the ocean systems. Um, freshwater are the, are the smaller ones because there's not a, actually, there's not a lot of fresh water around on the surface of the earth. Um, most of the, uh, the vast majority of the water on the surface of the earth is actually sea, so it's salty. Okay. Um, freshwater ecosystems of course are things like inland, inland lakes, um, ponds, which are uh, typically uh, quite local, um, and rivers, of course. Um, some of the rivers are quite big. Uh, some of these rivers also contain particular fauna, such as the, uh, the various types of river dolphins um, in the Amazon, but also in the, uh, there's an example here, in the Yangtze, and also in the, um, uh, <coughs> in the, the Ganges, for example, uh, and these are species which are extremely, uh, extremely rare now and extremely uh, endangered, because of course rivers are uh, one of the classic um, ways for people to move around and to move. Um, uh, move materials at least historically I mean now we fly everywhere but uh, historically speaking cities grew up along rivers because rivers are a source of water uh, sort of possibly a source of, uh, of energy but uh, more than anything else a source of water and a source of let's say drainage uh, where you can put your refuse um, and also a source of, uh, of, uh, of transport. Um, marine ecosystems uh, are um, Relatively, relatively self-contained, um, but this is this is to do with this is to do with the, the physiology of the thing, because um, most, if if not all, land animals could not survive in, uh, or even uh, freshwater animals could not survive in seawater simply because of the the, the saltiness. So it's a physical chemical problem, it's osmosis basically, um, and so you need special adaptation. So although 75% of, of the Earth's surface is covered by sea, um, the actual ecosystem itself is relatively, uh, relatively self-contained because you need, you, need to, you need special adaptations in order to survive there. Okay? Um, although we should also remember that um, as part of these ecosystems, we have um, uh, we have seabirds, uh, which are and some animals, some uh, uh, some mammals, uh, such as sea otters, which are able to um, to hunt uh, and which are which hunt within uh, close to the surface of the sea. Um, they hunt fish and uh, and such forth. So I think we had last time the example of the otters, the, the Californian sea otters which were uh, playing an important part in the sea, in a marine ecosystem, even though they themselves do not 
they're not actually aquatic animals. Um, okay, so we obviously have different. Let me just see if I can get rid of that. Ah, okay, um, we have obviously have different uh, uh, different parts of the sea. You've got the sea which is close to the shore. Uh, you may have coral reefs. Um, you have uh, different temperatures of the water. So the water, the Arctic Sea, compared to the tropical seas, you have uh, deep water. Um, such things as the, the ocean trenches, so if you think about the Marianas Trench in uh, the Philippines uh, compared to the uh, the mid-ocean floor in the Atlantic um, these things are these these uh, systems are uh, ecosystems are really quite uh, uh, quite different okay so um, and then, yeah, as I say, we've got uh, warm water, so the, 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 the tropical seas, the Caribbean, the Arafura, etc. Okay, so as far as the seas are co concerned, they are, <clears throat> let's say, um, very, uh, very much self contained. But one of the important things which happens in the sea, uh, which is also happening on land, but we see this uh, more clearly, um, is photosynthesis. Um, now I'm not going to go into any details whatsoever about the. the it's a, it really is a, a it's a miracle of nature, um, but it's basically getting energy from the sun and using it to do some chemistry, um, and by taking in energy from the sun and taking in some carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, the primary producers such as plants or in the case of the sea the phytoplankton uh, are able to convert CO2 into useful uh, sugar molecules which are then used to do other things um, either produce energy or create create mass so when you look at a tree or when you look at a plant and you might see a nice beautiful green tree this is um, this is carbon dioxide which has been captured from the from the atmosphere and it has been put into long chains so that it can't uh, it can't escape so um, from the point of view of carbon dioxide and we're going to keep coming back to carbon dioxide um, the phytoplankton play an important and an absolutely fundamental role in an, in absorbing uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere um, simply because there's just so there's just so much phytoplankton, the the seas are so big, and there's uh, where there are enough nutrients, the phytoplankton will uh, will uh, will bloom, and they set off a whole uh, whole food chain, which you can see here. Um, phytoplankton are eaten by the zooplankton. Okay, so this is plants, this is animals. Uh, the zooplankton, which are the small anim animalcules, uh, which uh, uh, have sometimes have pretty weird shapes, um, they are eaten by larvae of var var various types: fish larvae, octopus, etc., etc. Um, small fish, and then you've got the whole, you know, the, the whole, the whole food, food chain. But it's based on this process of the phytoplankton taking the CO2 and using it, just as a plant. Okay. Okay. So this leads me to uh, leads me to excuse me. Um, this leads me to thinking uh, to thinking about the um, the characteristics that these uh, these ecosystems all have in common. So yes, they're different, but there are some fundamental characteristics with they, which they have. Um, in common and these characteristics are that there is a, a flow of energy and ultimately this energy comes from the sun okay um, although there is an asterisk I'll just say something about that in a minute um, there is a cycling of minerals so carbon nitrogen phosphorus sulfur uh, there is a there's a, a way in which these things are uh, Captured, converted, used, and then uh, thrown out, if you like. So there is a uh, there is a cycle, and there's also a cycling of water, which is probably more familiar. Um, 
Okay, so the, the energy, uh, the energy, this is very, very important uh, for life on Earth. Uh, photosynthesis is the main process by which energy is captured and stored and then transferred. Um, but in some ecosystems, very, very special cases in uh, deep sea volcanic vents, um, the energy actually comes from uh, hydrothermal processes and biochemical processes based on sulfur. Very, 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 very particular uh, conditions. And these are the sorts of extreme conditions that give, make people think that maybe uh, life could be present in other, in other places in the solar system. Um, but we'll have to see. Okay, so... Um, if we think about cycles, uh, the main the main cycles that you're probably familiar with will be water, the water cycle, uh, and maybe the carbon cycle, and perhaps the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen cycle. Um, so, remembering that the ecosystem is this combination of living things, the um, uh, the biotic and the, abi and the and an abiotic part, which is a physical uh, physical environment. Um, so what you have is you have according to uh, according to your uh, where you are in the world, your temperature, your uh, conditions of climate, the rocks that you're sitting on or growing on or whatever. You will have. Uh, you will have uh, different rates of, of, of cycling happening. Um, and so uh, the important thing here is to, um, is to just appreciate the idea that the dyna 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 dynamic nature of the ecosystem is, is encapsulated in the idea of these uh, cycles. Um, so uh, these are chemical it chemical processes in the end so there's no there's no escape there's no escaping this um, but what is important and what does happen uh, in different let's say in the different uh, ecosystems is you have um, different amounts of, of things site going around the cycle at, uh, in different time frames so remembering uh, this is a word which you may which you probably are familiar with but just to uh, underline it because this is something which is it's a very important word to keep in mind when we're talking about something which is dynamic we need to always ask how much is changing in how much time so how many tons or how many grams or how many whatever atoms are changing in a year, a day, a second. Okay, so this is what we need to be uh, we need to be remembering, because in the, di the point of the dynamic system is that you have things flowing, you have this idea of flux. Okay, and this is an example uh, here. This is the uh, a very very schematic diagram of the carbon cycle. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in any detail because we're going to discuss this. Uh, in, a, in a little while in a bit more detail but you can see that you have arrows sort of going here and there indicating that things are being converted into different uh, things this is the water cycle again we have um, just evaporation transport transportation condensation precipitation uh, and then you have the whole thing sort of going around and going around again okay so um, of course if we uh, what's the point of uh, what's the main point of this is is that um, if we are thinking about things as cycles then it become it's a bit like your bicycle if a part of your wheel is not working <laughs> yeah you, you're not you're not going to have a, uh, an easy time cycling okay so because of the interconnectedness of this of course if you start to um, if you start to interrupt parts of this uh, parts of this this process, um, you're going to you, you're going to potentially cause problems. And this is the the the, the idea of interconnectedness. 
Okay, so again, this is something which we will keep coming back to. Um, okay, so uh, we've got this idea of, uh, of this constant evolution of, or the con this constant movement of um, and dynamis dyna dynamic nature of these, uh, these systems. Um, just taking the simple example of the zebra, which is uh, which is eating uh, eating some grass, and it uh, of course it uh, it's actually it's actually causing harm to the grass because the grass is not there as a, as food for the zebra. The grass is there for itself. Um, it just happens to be food for the zebra. The zebra comes along, takes uh, a few mouthful uh, mouthfuls of it, and of course digests it, and then of course it makes droppings which are then potentially used by uh, other uh, animals such as the uh, the dung beetle or they are uh, the the droppings are broken down and taken into the earth by insects and earthworms and stuff so there's a constant uh, constant movement even thinking about uh, things like um, uh, if you think about a herd of elephants walking across the savannah they are compacting uh, compacting the soil, whereas earthworms will uh, aerate the soil, for example. Um, having a plant, you create shade. You create shade. And having shade, you regulate humidity or you change the humidity and temperature characteristics. So you can see how uh, these things can. Um, uh, these ecosystems uh, then they're not uh, they're not just simply uh, a bunch of animals or plants uh, feeding off each other there are very very subtle uh, subtle interactions going on here okay um, when things die we have <coughs> fungi uh, mushrooms which will <coughs> which are perfectly adapted to which are perfectly adapted to extracting the um, uh, as much nutrients as the, as many nutrients as much nutrients as they can from the um, from the, the, the dead material. Um, and we have bacteria which also do this, uh, and they also feed on the, on the fungi. And you have fungi that feed on the fungi. Um, you also have bacteria which are um, just for example uh, symbiotic so that they are uh, specially adapted to um, feed on um, uh, partially died, partially broken up uh, cellulose uh, for example in the uh, in the in the ruminants that's in the cows um, you've got other bacteria which are able to fix nitrogen from the air and you have these in the nodules in uh, in the bean in the roots of bean uh, legumes and bean uh, plants. So you've got a lot of different interactions going on at uh, different um, uh, different levels. So um, sometimes external events can cause problems. Uh, so um, when there is an external event, uh, the whole the whole system gets a bit of a shock, um, and that can uh, that can cause some species to be no longer equipped to um, to survive. Uh, so just thinking of the example of the uh, in the 1700s, there were a number of uh, large volcanic eruptions, uh, one of which uh, affected northern Europe quite severely. Uh, Laki, which is a, a volcano in Iceland, reduced sunlight, uh, reduced the amount of sunlight um, uh, over a couple of summers and this was because it produced aerosols which reflected light back and in fact the records talk of um, summers, summers being ex unusually cruel, uh, crops didn't grow very well and so uh, it, it, these are the sorts of things which can cause obviously cause, uh, cause problems and in some cases complete ecosystems may actually uh, disappear. Okay, so energy flow. Um, you will have heard of the law of the conservation of energy. Um, and apart from, uh, if you believe in cold fusion, uh, the uh, law of conservation of energy states that you cannot 
create nor destroy energy, but you can only transform it. Um, a few more bits and pieces to add to that, um, and that transformation is never 100%. Uh, so there are all, there's always entropy, there's always loss of, loss of heat to the system. So um, when we're talking about an ecosystem, we are talking about the relationship between the sun, uh, the plant, which is the primary producer, and then the, the various consumers after this. Um, so we get the idea of uh, we get the idea of an energy flow. So the energy flow is flowing through these different um, uh, through these these different what we call trophic levels and <coughs> a trophic level basically is a description of the relationship between an organism and the primary sources of energy which in this case would be the sun so it's clear that the the lion and the wolf <coughs> are at much higher trophic level than the um, uh, than the plants, which are the, the primary source of, uh, of food, and they are the primary producers which are taking the energy from the sun. And so what you will have in any, in any uh, ecosystem, in any food chain or food web, you will have uh, a, like a pyramid where you will have um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of primary producers, a certain number of middlemen, let's say, and then a certain, a much, much smaller number of uh, apex, uh, uh, apex species which are um, feeding off the, uh, the other components, okay? So um, there are typically, uh, typically five, but you can have different numbers. It, it, it depends on the ecosystem. But without going into too much detail, uh, the primaries are the, the plants, uh, the, the prime producers, the primary consumers of the herbivores. Uh, the secondaries, uh, secondary consumers are um, specialized carnivores which only consume uh, primary consumers. The tertiaries are typically omnivorous, so they eat what they can, when they can. Um, they will sometimes be carnivorous, they will sometimes be uh, herbivorous according to the situation. And then you will have the apex predators which are the, uh, those animals which don't have a natural predator within that system. Um, these are the top of the food chain and these are the ones which we typically recognize, the lions, the tigers, the eagles. Uh, these are the, uh, let's say, the, 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 spectacular, uh, the spectacular animals. Now, in terms of energy, um, in terms of energy, well, uh, this is just a, uh, let's say, a very sort of rough um, description of how much energy is lost between each trophic level. So, of course, of course, we don't typically go around eating these guys, okay, but we do eat these and we do eat these. Um, so we are we are sort of uh, we we would be secondary consumers under most con uh, if not tertiary consumers sometimes. Um, but the point is that from all of this energy uh, from um, from the sun uh, we get a huge loss at each um, at each step. Okay, so it's not quite a tenfold loss, but it's approximately a magnitude. So this tells us that um, food production is very, very can be very inefficient, particularly if we are um, feeding plants to animals which we then consume. Okay. Now there can be other reasons for consuming consuming animals, which can be uh, around. Um, uh, uh, nutrition in terms of uh, the, the, the nutritional needs of uh, what, uh, that you might you may have or what have you, but the point is that there is a lot of energy lost. It's not very efficient, um, and so this type of uh, let's say this type of um, diagram becomes useful when we start to think about. Um, 
large scale farming and supplying food to, to the world, okay, and also the effects of, of food production. But we're not going to talk about that now. It's just I'm introducing it here because it's a uh, it's a keystone um, idea that the more levels you have, the more inefficient the transfer of um, of, of energy. Okay. Okay, so uh, we've talked about biomes, we've talked about ecosystems and pythons and stuff. Uh, some of this is quite, uh, it's, all, it's, it's all nice stuff to talk about animals. Uh, animals are, are great. Um, but we also need to reflect on the fact that the world is, well, we act as if it's ours. Uh, and for most people, uh, this is how uh, this is how uh, the world is. It's the place where we live. Uh, so, um, one of the key concepts that's been developed over the last few years and has become very much, uh, let's say, very much to the fore is this idea of the of the anthrop anthropocene. Uh, anthropocene is the if you haven't heard about it is the it's a term which scientists are starting to use to describe our current geological epoch. A, geolo a geological epoch is simply the time a time period in the history of the Earth. Okay, um, and perhaps, well, almost certainly for the first time in the world in the Earth's history, there is a species on the planet that is actually able to. Uh, let's say think about and uh, reflect on its own position in this huge long geological story um, and the point is that because of the way uh, things have evolved in over the last uh, 100, 100, 150 200 years um, people human activity has has started to have and has a major effect on all of the elements of the uh, of the so-called Earth system. That's from atmospheric, geological, hydrological systems, and this in turn has effects on the biosphere. So um, now this is uh, this this picture for anyone who's ever been to Scotland. Uh, this is probably the only sunny day that there has ever been in the north of Scotland. This is Glencoe, which is uh, uh, the highlands of Scotland are, are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful places. Um, I was brought up near nor uh, near the North Yorkshire moorland, which is the same sort of thing but flat. Um, but this is not the natural. This is not how it should be. This should be con the the valley should be. Uh, it should be covered in trees. It should be a forest. It should be a mixed, uh, a mixed deciduous forest. Um, why is it like this? Well, uh, this is from about 1500, 1600 on, onwards. Uh, there was a huge need for for wood for building ships, and the ships were huge. The ships were bigger, uh, and particularly in the 1700s and the 1800s. Um, there was a lot of need for <coughs> for timber, and so there was massive deforestation. This also went hand in hand with the idea of clearing trees for for farming, um, which seems to be a little bit of uh, deja vu when we hear about the deforestation in uh, Brazil, for example. Similar similar things happened. I know in Spain certainly. Um, uh, I think also probably in parts of France, but um, the point is that certainly in the UK, the what is what is seen as a natural landscape is absolutely not natural at all. Okay, so there's a there's a lot of uh, a lot of effects on, on uh, of human activity on the. Um, on the environment, not just from building, uh, not just from clearing trees, but also extracting minerals and farming and all of all of this sort of stuff. Okay, so um, we have a 
uh, a transformation of the environment. So, for example, this field, this is definitely not a, definitely not natural. Uh, it's definitely not a um, not a particularly biodiverse uh, uh, environment, for example. So, um, when we start to do agriculture on this on this scale, or when we start to make changes on this scale, of course, we're going to have effects on uh, the the ecosystem in terms of um, the amount of water that's used, the amount of uh, um, the amount of the places where the animals can actually live, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, it's a, it's a, it's part of the dynamic nature of the thing, but it's also uh, it's also we are transforming um, the environment. So if we think about uh, the the 1930s, the Dust Bowls, the famous Dust Bowls of, of, of the US. Anyone who is a fan of Steinbeck, uh, John Steinbeck, the author, <coughs> um, uh, he, <coughs> his stories, uh, particularly East of Eden, uh, is, uh, his stories are based very much around um, the, the human aspect of these uh, environmental disasters as people had to uh, cope with economic depression but also large-scale uh, environmental uh, destruction in order, and they they had to they, they escaped to um, <coughs> to the to a better life in California or so they thought okay so what about uh, cities well um, perhaps we don't really think about cities as being ecosystems but they are um, this is a this is a photograph from the UK uh, I didn't take it but it's uh, uh, it's well known that about 30 percent of the fox population in the UK lives in cities and um, I think perhaps this is because the uh, the city planning in the UK is uh, sort of lends itself to having populations of, uh, of urban, medium-sized urban mammals because uh, a lot of people have gardens um, and there's lots of uh, there are lots of spaces between things which get abandoned and so there are lots of places where animals can of course uh, uh, can of course uh, let's say uh, take root and animals like foxes are particularly well adapted because they're relatively small agile and extremely intelligent so um, uh, we've also seen uh, I think my, my, yeah this one um, <laughs> the, uh, certainly Barcelona has has a problem with wild boars uh, and so has Rome. Uh, Rome is not not the only place in Italy that has problems with these uh, these things. Um, unfortunately, the still the photo is very difficult to see. But basically, this is a car park. Uh, there's a lady. Um, and these things here. These are actually wild boars. Uh, and basically, what happened? This was just a couple of weeks ago. Um, this lady came out of the supermarket. She went to her car to put the the bags in the car with her shopping, and the wild boars basically two two females and five five uh, five pups. I'm not sure whether they're pups or piglets, but whatever. Um, five young boars basically attacked her to steal her shopping because they know that there is food. Okay, and they're very, very aggressive. They can be very dangerous. These animals. So, uh, and in I know that in Barcelona, um, in the outskirts near uh, near the near the edges of the city where the the, the you're near uh, forest or woodland, um, the wild boars have actually learned how to turn over the uh, the bins which people use for the rubbish. And so they've learned how to do this, and so they can. Uh, there's lots and lots of food available for them. It's a big, big problem. Okay, um, what about uh, what about the idea of rewilding? Uh, the idea of rewilding is the idea of uh, turning the clock back. Uh, so reintroducing species now uh, species that were once there but we which were uh, either driven to extinction or uh, 
uh, they died out within the uh, within the uh, the space uh, within the area. And classic example is the wolf. Um, the wolf has a particular, let's say, uh, place in the um, in the psychodrama of European fairy tales, uh, folk tales. Uh, we just have to think about Little Red Riding Hood, um, and of course, uh, the, in the past, yes, there were wolves around, and they were. They, it was a dangerous thing to do to go from one city to the next in the middle of uh, uh, in the middle of the uh, Teutoburg forest in Germany. So. Um, this this is certainly something which, uh, uh, with the idea of reintroducing potentially dangerous species, uh, is for some people is a bit uh, doesn't really make much sense. Of course, the people who quite often uh, are usually object to this are farmers, uh, and quite uh, understandably. However, um, there are many there are several examples across Europe of successful successful reintroduction and the um, the uh, the let's say the, the the objections of the farmers can be managed by uh, proper compensation schemes etc so again this is something which is uh, which is something which can be um, uh, which can be uh, managed. Um, another example, which is maybe not quite so, um, which is maybe not quite so dramatic. Well, at least not quite so emotional. But in terms of drama, in terms of how dramatic it is, this is actually a very interesting example because um, beavers were also uh, were also. Uh, endemic in the UK. Uh, I, I'm use, I use a lot of UK examples simply because I know the context. Uh, I know the context better. Um, but the they were also driven to extinction because of, of fur hunting. Um, now beavers are, as, as mentioned in an earlier slide, they are nature's engineers. And one of the uh, one of the the characteristics of rivers which are where beavers are present is that they tend to um, they tend to have uh, reduced flow rates because the, the beavers create areas where there's high flow and low flow and um, this has a big impact on flooding now over the last well 20 30 40 years there's been a, obviously an increase in population more houses have been built and many houses are built in places which you shouldn't really build houses because there's a danger of uh, of, of, of flooding um, and in the southwest of uh, of, uh, of England um, on the river Otter which is the real name of the river um, a number of beavers were introduced and they their effects were very closely monitored and this was uh, although it was initially contested uh, it actually became uh, something which was overcome for several reasons first of all the practical uh, advantage of the engineering which these animals were doing um, but also it was in, it was attracting tourists to come and do beaver watching and see these animals so it was helping the local economy so uh, these are things which uh, which are important so um, simply simply put why we should give this attention to ecosystems is that um, we depend on them Actually, I feel like I depend on the supermarket, but I know that behind it, the supermarket depends on the ecosystems, okay? Because it's all, uh, we've got agriculture, basically, whether that's uh, vegetable production, fruit production, meat production. Um, and these uh, vegetable production or fruit production requires natural processes such as pollination. It requires, uh, it's taking resources from the ground. It, so uh, it's also using the, the hydrological resources of the, of the system. So um, this is why uh, it's very important that we, uh, we think carefully about how we, uh, how we deal with ecosystems, okay? Um, of course, some 
uh, agricultural techniques use an, in, an understanding of ecosystems in order to um, uh, in order to make the best of uh, in order to make the best of things. And in fact, going back to earlier times in the medieval period, um, the agricultural system was not particularly efficient, uh, but it was it it recognised. The, let's say the limits of the system in the terms of uh, there was a deliberate crop rotation because people knew that you couldn't keep growing the same thing in the same field for a certain number of, for for more than a certain number of years. So there was more attention uh, paid to uh, to this, but of course, with the advent of fertilize, uh, industrial fertilizers, um, you could basically grow anything anywhere. Okay, so um, I'm now going to introduce a concept which uh, it, I, I would confess it was a bit new to me because I hadn't really I hadn't really come across this before. Um, the idea of ecosystem services. Mm, now that sounds a little bit management-ish, management speak. Uh, ecosystem services, maybe economy, not sure. Um, but basically, it is about uh, being able to evaluate the value that ecosystems actually provide to people. Okay, so uh, this is a quote from the FAO. Um, uh, da, 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 yeah, okay, which is the uh, UN Organization for Agriculture. Um, this might be the Italian acronym, I'm not sure, because I, I get, there's such a confusion in my head sometimes. But anyway, 125, 125 trillion dollars, trillion, so that's million, million, worth of ecosystem services make human life possible by, by providing food, clean water, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the point is that they, what they're doing is they're giving, um, they're, they're attaching a value to, uh, the, to uh, the things which the ecosystem provides. Now, you may, you may say, but why should we, why should we do that? Because surely, um, uh, surely some things about an ecosystem are, are completely intangible. Um, well, I think part of it is that in order to, let's say, push back against uh, against development, which is without, let's say, which sees the quantity of uh, of money gained or the quantity of resource gained from a human point of view, um, there's nothing which is speaking up for the ecosystem. And so uh, the idea is to be able to quantify the impact of potential changes. So for example, uh, we take the soils, and we take soil fertility, fertility for granted, but in a way they can be considered as a service that the ecosystem uh, gives back to the farmer and to society. Okay, so what sort of services do ecosystems offer? Well, you've got simple things like, well, uh, products, food, uh, fresh water, um, more subtle as genetic resources is the fact that there is a, a variety of things. We have a regulatory uh, service. So we think about uh, climate. Uh, we think about uh, noise, we can think about pollination, we can think about disease, uh, water, okay. Uh, we can think about uh, support type uh, services which are offered. So we have formation of soils, the cycling of nutrients, uh, primary production, which is capturing the energy from the sun. Um, and then we have, let's say, cultural services, which are um, much more um, intangible, non-material, um, but which reflect uh, a view which is uh, spiritual or uh, which may be, uh, so I'm just thinking about, for example, um, Mount Everest is considered a, a, holy, uh, a holy mountain. Um, you have, in the UK, we've got the, we've got the, the Lake District, the land of the poets, 
uh, which is uh, very particular. Um, you've got simply recreation tourism, the aesthetic experience of being in a beautiful place. So this idea is that uh, the idea here is that these services, these ecosystems can be regarded as providing uh, services to people. And of course, uh, if the ecosystem is degraded, it can't provide a service. And it's well, it's well recognised that um, uh, by degrading uh, an ecosystem, um, you have a, a negative effect on the biodiversity, and that uh, leads out leads into a whole set of knock-on effects, which um, make the uh, the ecosystem itself less resilient, less able to. Um, let's say manage the impact of change, but also <clears throat> from a, on a wider perspective, they're not able to mitigate effects of climate climate change and could even have a, a, a deleterious uh, effect. Um, so the idea is that uh, by incorporating um, the idea of ecosystems into the uh, into decision making, ecosystem services into decision making, uh, we can make better uh, people can make better decisions. Okay. Okay. So this is a bit negative, unfortunately. Um, this is probably a very conservative estimate. Almost one third of the Earth's ecosystems have been transformed or destroyed. Um, uh, much of the remaining two thirds uh, is heavily fragmented, um, invasive species, species pollution. Um, over 60% of ecosystem services are considered degraded. Um, I think in Europe we have a, a rather, uh, a, yeah, a, a rather let's say strange situation because historically um, uh, Europe is <coughs> is heavily populated, and so. Uh, our ecosystems, even sort of considering the uh, the examples of, uh, of the UK, um, they are already, let's say, um, uh, compromised in uh, in many ways. But that doesn't mean to say that uh, we shouldn't be doing everything we can to try and protect them. Okay, so. Um, Okay, let me just. Okay, so just uh, just uh, something about insects. Uh, I'm not an entomologist, but I do feel sorry for these guys. Um, there has been a, a decline in um, number of in insects over uh, over the last well 30, 40 years, um, and this uh, this is actually um, very very much linked to um, Farming techniques, so go, moving to monoculture, um, and also uh, degra again degradation of uh, of, uh, of ecosystems in general. And these uh, this is telling because insects play a very vital role in the let's say in the, uh, in, at the in, within the ecosystems in terms of pollinating, in terms of pest control, even though some of them are pests themselves. So, uh, as it says here, the problem is that uh, this guy uh, is not, well, the colours are quite spectacular, but the, I don't think he, anyone would define him as uh, being particularly cute. Uh, pandas uh, win, <laughs> win hands down. No one is going to stand up for a cockroach, I don't think. So, okay. So, we need to preserve uh, ecosystems because of um, what they provide us in terms of uh, food and water and uh, also materials. Okay, so I think that's it. That's it for the ecosystem. I'm just going to leave it uh, leave it here. So we've looked at some uh, basic concepts. We've got some ideas of ecosystems and biomes, energy flow. We will come back to this again. Uh, this idea of the interconnectedness of things. And uh, finally, this viewpoint, which I think maybe is a little bit new for people, this idea of considering ecosystems as providing uh, as providing a service, um, so that we can uh, we can let's say um, 
in a way f pu push back against in indiscriminate uh, development where it's not needed. Okay, right now let me just let me just stop this. I'm just going to stop the screen sharing for two seconds, uh, and I'm going to see. Uh, we're on compact view, active speaker view. Okay, I think this is coming up now. Hold on a minute. Okay, right. Uh, let's see if there's a chat. Okay, hello. Right, okay, so if uh, if everyone is okay, uh, I don't know whether anyone's got any, any questions on this. If anyone's got uh, any questions, you can uh, put them on the chat. Um, what I'm going to do now is, if you if you are if you're feeling ready, uh, I'm going to move over to the uh, the second thing which I wanted to do today. Hopefully, there will be time, uh, which is to uh, to talk about something which is um, related to. Let me just say that two seconds. This takes a couple of minutes. Couple of seconds. Okay, right now I can see. I can see Stefano is uh, is there. Okay. Yeah, um, perfect. Right. I'm just going to move over to another set of slides now. Okay. And okay. this is where you need your pencil and your paper. Okay. Okay. I catch the pencil. Okay. Right. So uh, let me just share my screen. And uh, hopefully you should see this come up. <coughs> okay, let me uh, mute for a while and uh, and see. Uh... Oh, welcome, Agnese. Uh So please, uh, all of you have a, a well a sheet of paper and a pen or or a pencil. It doesn't pencil. matter. Yeah. Some sort of drawing implement. Just give okay. us a feedback, please. <coughs> uh, we want to know how many will participate, you know, because we have a silent blocks. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. It's always the no same. No screen, no, no okay. signs. Okay, okay, so let's just... Like a graveyard, then. <laughs> let's just graveyard. Let's just say that at the end of, at the end of this... Um, if anyone has, uh, it will be very interesting to see um, uh, to see the, di the drawings that people produce. Um, and if you take a photograph and just sort of send it, uh, either put, I don't know whether you can put it on the chat here, but maybe uh, maybe send it uh, send it to Stefano. Um, so it, just to see what people do. Okay, so um, now. I'm not going to go into heavy chemistry here, but um, we mentioned within the ecosystems thing, uh, the thing about carbon dioxide. And we talked about uh, carbon cycles, okay? So this is what I'm going to be talking about, uh, or this is what we're going to do together now, okay? So um, before we start, I'm just going to bring up this quote again, which I think is the, it is the quote which needs to be remind, which needs to be remembered uh, when we are talking about um, uh, when we are talking about these uh, these complex systems. So, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go into the into the, the, the let's say the um, the theory behind this statement, which is perfectly accurate. Um, so let's just bear this in mind. So we have a, uh, a complex problem, um, and we're going to be looking at carbon dioxide and its central its central role in uh, in global warming. So um, you've got your you've got your piece of paper, and I want you to draw in the middle of the piece of paper. I want you to draw a bathtub. Okay. Uh, and in the bathtub, I want you to put uh, this this phrase. Now it could be in your own language; it doesn't matter. But it, basically, what the bathtub is going to represent, it's going to represent a container, <coughs> which 
which is the atmosphere, uh, the atmosphere of, of our planet. And this container will contain carbon dioxide. Okay. Uh, obviously, it contains other stuff. It's just that we're only looking at the the carbon di the amount of carbon dioxide. Okay. So, hopefully, you've had chance to scribble down a, a bathtub. So, above the bathtub, I want you to draw a couple of trees. Now, you don't have to be uh, you don't have to be a uh, a Leonardo da Vinci or a, a Vincent van Gogh to, to draw these trees. Uh, a couple of squiggles on a piece of paper will do. Okay. Now give yourself plenty of space. Okay. Give yourself plenty of space between these two. So uh, because we're going to be making some notes as well. Okay. It's it's going to get a little bit busy. So let me just help you through this. So this represents vegetation. And soil. Okay, so that's all the all the green stuff that you that you see, trees and whatever. Okay, so this is vegetation and soil. Okay, so if you're ready, um, this one's a little bit more complicated. I'm just going to move Stefano move Stefano over here. Um, I want you to draw fish and some shells and some sand. Okay, so this is what I want you to put on the left of the bathtub yeah so we've got the sea basically so we've got uh, we've got some fish we've got some seashells and we've got some well sediment I'm being a little bit more technical but it starts off as sand okay okay so um, I'll give you I'll give you just a couple of uh, a couple of seconds to 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 draw your fish and your shell. Uh, don't draw. I would typically draw a scallop because they're a bit easier to draw. Okay, this is just the the icon is just the easiest one to find. So, um, okay. So what we've got is we've got bathtub, forest, and we've got the sea. Okay. Okay. So underneath. The bathtub. Um, I want you to draw, draw some mountains and some layers of rock underneath them. So we can draw something like this. Okay, this is a little bit more complicated, uh, a little bit more involved. But what's the idea here? Um, well, we are representing uh, a process, the process of mountain building, which is a geological process, of course. And we're representing the um, the deep layers of rock under the earth, under the earth's surface. Um, now, just make a, I just want to make a note here that you should put in a sort of a blob. It doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't have to be a perfect shape, just a blob. This represents oil and gas, okay, and coal, okay. Oil, gas, and coal. So that's that's what this is representing. Yeah. So if this is uh, if this is okay, I'm going to take this a little bit further. Okay. So this is an easy one. Uh, to the top right of the bathtub, um, draw a volcano. Okay. Uh, so a nice little volcano. Um, this is representing geological processes but at the surface of the earth okay so whereas this is stuff that's happening over long periods of time this is stuff that's happening now okay so like a, a volcano erupts in uh, I think there's one erupting in uh, Goma in uh, Nigeria at the moment uh, and it seems to be causing a few problems for people so um, okay so let me just put this it's a bit of a Bit of a pain, this. Uh, <laughs> okay, and if you're ready, I hope you are. I hope I'm not going too quickly here. Um, there is something missing. This is the Earth system. There is something missing, and what is missing is human activity. Now, um, for the human activity, I've chosen I've just chosen two symbols here but let's remember that this is not 
the totality of human activity in the sense that um, this symbol, where is it? This symbol here represents um, industry. And this symbol here obviously represents agriculture. But of course, we also have cities. We have all of the stuff, all of the things that we do um, sort of, let's say, encapsulated in these uh, rather simple sim symbols. OK, so hopefully you should have these various pieces uh, put together on your uh, on your piece of paper now I usually do I usually when I do this with students I usually um, uh, I usually do it on a board uh, either with a piece of chalk or I do it on a, a an electronic blackboard um, and so I have an idea of how long it takes for people to to draw stuff and I can look around to see who's doing what um, so I'm just I'm just going to move along now, so you should have had enough time to uh, to draw uh, draw a, a rough uh, a rough factory and a rough cow. Okay, so so this is the question. This is the question. Um, you're probably wondering, first of all, why do we have a bathtub in the middle? Um, but then, second of all, what are these different things? How are they connected to the bathtub? Well. The connection is this. Um, so I'm just going to remove the diagram for a second. It, don't worry, it's going to come back. Um, I need to introduce some uh, some terminology, which is used in um, which is used to describe um, what happens to the carbon dioxide. Okay. So you can think of uh, each of these elements. So let me just, I'm just going to go back two seconds. Let's think of the, uh, let's think of, of this, for example, the forest. You can think of it as either producing carbon dioxide or taking carbon dioxide, okay, capturing carbon dioxide, or it could do both. OK, so when something captures the carbon dioxide, it's called a sink. OK, when something produces carbon dioxide, it's called a source. OK, so what we're thinking of is we're thinking about how uh, these different elements, so your forest, the sea, the mountains, uh, the the human activity and the volcano, how these things are acting either as sinks or sources of carbon dioxide. Okay? And as I said here, uh, some elements can be both, and we're going to see that in a minute, um, but the important thing is, is this, how much is captured compared to how much is produced. So in other words, the balance between these two. Okay? As I will try to explain, they can't be perfectly in balance because it wouldn't make sense. But we'll see that also from the numbers, and you, you'll see why. Okay? So, what's the thing about the bathtub? Well, just think about a bathtub, your, your personal experience of bathtubs or a sink. Okay? Um, so, if you have a, a bathtub which you are filling with water, um, if you leave the plug, if you leave the plug open, water will flow out as water flows in. If more water flows in than flows out, in other words, if the rate of flow here is higher than the rate here, the water in the bathtub will start to go up. If instead uh, only a little is coming in and a lot's going out, then it, obviously the, the the level would go down, or it, you wouldn't even get a get a level; it would just flow straight out. Okay, so the point is that we're looking at what's coming in and what's going out. Okay, so if that's if that hopefully that's that's clear. Um, I'm going to come back to my diagram now. 
and hopefully you have something which is sort of quite uh, quite pretty. Um, okay, so we'll look at the forests first because the forests are easier to uh, easier to to understand. The more uh, the more let's say they're more present because we uh, we we see trees every day. So um, okay, so. There are two processes which are happening here. One is the process of photosynthesis because the plants and so they are primary producers, so they're taking carbon dioxide. Okay. Now it's true uh, they produce oxygen in this process, and it's just as well that they do because uh, that's what we are, that's what we breathe. Um, however they also respire, they also breathe. Okay. Now I'm using the term respiration here in the scientific sense which is uh, cellular respiration to get energy. Yeah. So they use oxygen to help the cell, if you like, burn glucose, in other words break glucose into pieces in order to get the energy from it. Okay. So what you've got is you've got carbon dioxide is being taken from the bathtub by photosynthesis but it's then being put back in the bathtub by respiration because if you think if you remember when we breathe we are taking in oxygen we are using the oxygen to break the glucose into pieces and one of the products is is carbon dioxide so we have um, a forest is both a sink and a source. Okay, so this is hopefully that's that's clear. So photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and makes stuff, hence the synthesis. Respiration or cellular respiration takes molecules like glucose and breaks them into pieces to get the energy, and this gives us carbon dioxide back. Okay, so that's the that's the forest. Um, so now let's have a look at the sea. Now this is, looks a little bit more complicated, I think, just because it's a little bit less familiar. Um, but we have essentially the same thing. If you remember, uh, I mentioned we mentioned phytoplankton, which are um, small plants in the sea and uh, they are photo they are very important for photosynthesis on such a on a very large scale but of course uh, even the phytoplankton they respire so they take in co2 and they give out co2 okay now the sea is a bit more complicated because it's taking place in water okay uh, so we have this extra uh, this extra complication. Uh, the sea is actually a pretty it's a pretty complex system from a physical chemical point of view. Um, but we can break we can break this down into two parts. There's a biological process going on, which is photosynthesis and respiration, and at the same time, and this is important that we remember that this is the, at the same time. There's a second process, which is a chemical process, because the CO2 in the atmosphere is soluble in in seawater to an extent, not a lot, but enough. Okay, so this is a chemical process or a physical chemical process. Um, if you want to think about this, this is like your uh, your uh, gassy water that you may drink, okay? Uh, there, the, the CO2 is put in under high pressure, um, but there's a certain amount of solubility, okay? So, the CO2 uh, dissolves in water, okay? Um, but this is an equilibrium, okay? However, the, CO, the CO2 that is, is, is dissolved in water can be taken by some organisms like shells to make their shell uh, which is calcium carbonate okay 
Now, what happens to shells when they die? They're at the bottom of the sea. They get covered with sediment. And over millions and millions and millions of years, they get crushed into sediment. And they eventually, the sediment is turned into rocks. Okay. Now, um, certainly here in northern Italy, uh, we just have to look to the north and see the, the Dolomites, which is a classic example of this type of process where you have uh, former sea uh, organisms, uh, sea creatures, uh, calciferous sea creatures, which contain carbon, uh, calcium carbonate, um, which have fossilized been turned into rock, been turned into limestone, dolomite, whatever. Okay, and then of course, over many, many millions of years and lots of pressure, this gets turned into into rock, which at some point uh, gives us. Let's just move that. Uh, gives us through the process of orogenesis. This is mountain making. Okay, this gives us the mountain ranges that we, uh, for example, the Alps or the, the Apennines or wherever. Okay. So as far as the sea is concerned, there are two things to remember. There's a biological process and there is a chemical process. And they're both going on at the same time. This is the basis of the food chain. So the fish are eating the phytoplankton and blah, blah, blah. And it's all, you know, and then the fish will die and end up in the sediment and what have you. Okay. But this is the main. Uh, uh, these are the these are the main things that are happening. And there's also the carbon dioxide, which is dissolving in the water. And this is a chemical, physical chemical process. Okay. So, uh, and this is sorry. And this is in equilibrium with the. Uh, there is a. The, it's being dissolved, but it's also. Um, uh, it's also coming out of the water until it, the, the, the rates balance. Okay. Okay. So as an addition, uh, an additional process here, which this is what makes the graph look a little bit complicated. But um, sometimes you get uh, vegetation, forests, and stuff, which uh, maybe uh, maybe get flooded near a lake or near a shore, and they end up being covered with water and then they end up being covered with sediment and they end up uh, as uh, as fossils within rocks um, but which are decomposing under particular conditions and this is where you get the formation of coal and oil and gas okay so these are the hydrocarbons now where this is all carbon this is all carbon stuff this is carbon as a as just the element oil is hydrocarbons and gas is typically methane and sometimes ethane and propane but it's basically carbon carbon and hydrogen okay where do these come from well they're coming from the cellulose uh, the cellulose where does this come from the cellulose comes from the glucose which was made in photosynthesis okay so what we have is we have a process by which carbon is being trapped in rock okay it's also being trapped in plants okay also in the phytoplankton it's also being trapped on a longer term in uh, deposits of coal oil and gas okay we have processes where carbon is being released back to the atmosphere through respiration in other words, living things breathing, basically. Okay, so this is hopefully this is not too not too complicated for you. Um, so, what happens next? Well, um, looking at our volcanoes, uh, sometimes you get uh, volcanoes uh, erupting, and sometimes they release carbon dioxide. Um, surprisingly, not a lot actually. <laughs> Um, some release more than others. It depends on the type of volcano. But volcanoes are important for other reasons, uh, not for the CO2. Okay, um, at least not uh, not uh, not in this uh, geological time period. In the past, things were a lot different when the Earth was virtually all volcanoes. This leaves this leaves this part here. 
human activity. Okay, so let's just have a look at this. First thing I've done is I've added an oil rig. So I'm extracting the coal, the gas, and the, the oil. Okay, so this is extracting. Why? Well, we need energy. Uh, energy is needed to drive cities, drive industry, um, which produce carbon dioxide, which goes into the bathtub. Um, agriculture uh, is carried out on a huge scale, and that also produces uh, carbon dioxide. It's true, there is a vegetation uh, which is taken, but um, the vegetation in um, uh, vegetation in, in agriculture, of course, is being used to uh, to provide uh, to provide food. Food. It's not actually uh, it's not actually sequestering the carbon uh, in and of itself, other than in the moment, let's say. So this is transitory. But we also have um, uh, we also have uh, sort of various uh, agricultural uh, practices which. Are producing uh, carbon dioxide so these are contributing okay so hopefully I haven't gone too quickly here hopefully this has been uh, this is relatively um, I'm not saying it's simple because it's not simple remember in Lincoln uh, we have to reflect we have to recognize and um, respect the complexity here okay but what we have is we have an idea that things that the CO2 is moving around. Okay. Now, um, what I've done here is I've taken a sort of a, 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 a very uh, I've taken the um, the sinks and the sources. I've tidied it up a little bit, and I put some numbers on here, and the numbers are what we need to look at and first of all uh, the unit of measure is gigaton that's 1000 million tons now I think it's easy <laughs> for, sci for scientists to throw around big numbers but it's actually incredibly difficult to appreciate what that number means because it's just so enormously big okay um, but what I can tell is I can tell well, okay so I have a certain amount of carbon dioxide now in the atmosphere yeah um, a certain amount is taken out and a certain amount is given back now notice that uh, the forests take 120 and give back 119 um, well this why doesn't it balance well this makes sense because the forests that we see contain the carbon that's captured which doesn't go back to the atmosphere okay so um, this is uh, this is the idea that you're taking out more than you the, you're taking out more than you give back okay so this is the idea of carbon capture carbon sequestering which is why forests are considered useful for this if we look at the sea we have a similar a similar process the, the the phytoplankton are taking more than the than the sea system is giving back okay um, the only thing is that we don't we don't have such a uh, such a good idea as to uh, how we could potentially uh, let's say manipulate the, the phytoplankton to take more but there's also the question of whether we really want to do that in order to uh, preserve the, uh, the the balance of the of the, of the uh, ecosystem in the sea. Okay. As far as um, as far as the let's say the coal, gas, and oil reserves are concerned, uh, that's what this refers to. Uh, there are there is a lot. It's 10 trillion tons. Okay. That's the that's the estimate. Um, so we need to look at the last two processes that we haven't really considered here. Uh, geological processes surprisingly only contributes about 100 million tons per year. Um, but it's this, this is the number that we need to think about because you can see that 9 gigatons 
from combined uh, activity, human activities. It's not, it's not big compared to these numbers. It's about 10% or 8% or whatever. But what you can see is that it's not the it's not the size of these numbers that matters, it's the difference. So this is one gigaton being taken, it's sequestered. This is two gigatons being sequestered. That's, that's three gigatons, but we are producing nine. So there is a, a deficit of six. Where does that six go? It goes in the bathtub, okay? And let me just see if we see if I can get there. Okay, so uh, I, I, do, I want to show you this graph because I think it's important. So um, this is these are measures of carbon dioxide over the last 800,000 years, and what you can see is that it's basically fairly fairly steady between 150 and 300 parts per million. This means 300 grams in a million grams, okay, uh, or 300 molecules in a million molecules, if you like. Um, it's fairly steady. It sort of goes up and down. It, it, it does vary um, until we get to here. Now, this is this scale is a linear scale, okay. So the last 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years are here somewhere. Okay, so it's the very, very last part of the graph. And you can see that this number, which is 410, is a lot, a lot bigger. It's a lot bigger than any number that's been previously seen in the last 800,000 years. Okay, now let's just have a look at the next graph, which uh, hopefully will cement this. Okay, so that's just that. Uh, this graph actually shows two things. Um, the purple line is the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. The blue line is um, the amount of CO2 emitted. Okay. Now, what you can see is that from the Industrial Revolution onwards, nothing much happens. Things stay fairly, fairly steady until we start to get into 1900. It's a bit shaky at the beginning of 1900, and then, of course, we have the exponential growth of the post-war post period. This is the economic boom, okay, and obviously this is, so, this is associated with the development of technologies, mass consumer society, all of this sort of stuff, okay. So, basically, what's happening, uh, or what has happened, is that the amount of CO2 has clearly increased as a result of um, increased human activity and I think okay uh, no it's not that's not what I want to say I just want to go back to yeah okay um, so if we think about the time scales for these things let me just go back to this one if we think about the time scales for this this is happening all the time this is happening all the time this is taking millions of years. This takes millions of years. It's a long, long time. It's very, very slow. Okay. This, well, from about 18, 1870, 1880, the formation of Standard Oil in the U.S. This is when the oil. This is when oil started to become really important. Um, and at the beginning, to be honest with, well, if you read the histories. Uh, uh, at the beginning, people didn't actually know what to do with the oil. <laughs> they knew that they could do something with it, but they didn't really know what what uh, what to do with it. Uh, and so, of course, uh, internal combustion engine and all of that sort of stuff really started to take off. And at that point, oil became the the uh, the, the driver of growth of industrial growth. And that's where we get where we get this. Okay. Now, I've realized that we've got about uh, five minutes left, and I've probably bored you guys to death. So let me just see if I can uh, come out of my share, stop the screen sharing, and let me just see view, and it's 
uh, gallery view. I think it's that one. I think. I'm really not very. There, I am not very good with this. Okay, here we go. Right, right. Okay, so uh, let me just open the the chat and if I can see some connection problem. Nice. We don't see any sharing. I've st I've stopped sharing now. Okay, great. Okay, so um, if anyone has any if anyone has any questions or any comments about this, now maybe this last part has been a little bit rushed or a little bit technical. I don't know. Um, hopefully, it wasn't too uh, let's say it wasn't too technical that uh, people couldn't follow. The key point is how things are connected to each other, and the key point is this idea of um, how the it's the level in the, of the CO2 in the atmosphere that we need to be aware of and where it comes from. Okay. I've depressed everybody. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm not sure. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm muted. No, 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 I was just curious as to. Oh. Yeah, it's a bit striking. Okay, I'm not sure whether that refers to the connection or whether that refers to the. Uh, Ah, okay. Ah, is that your Irene, I, Irina? Oh, this is nice. Oh, this is nice. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Wow. Yeah, it's very beautiful indeed. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very much, Irina. There's another one by yeah. Arne. Arne, can you make uh, a picture and upload it on the chat? Thank you. She, Arne made a very, very nice drawing as well. Is it on the chat now? I can't, I can't see it yet. I see her moving around. Maybe she has a button. Okay. Well. Hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, if that's, I think I was hoping that, uh, so hoping, hoping that someone. Uh, up at six now. Yeah, yeah, it's half past six. I was hoping that someone else would uh, produce a, a drawing, but okay, no, that's great. At least we got. At least I got one, which is. Which is great. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'd just like to take this opportunity of thanking everybody. Ah, oh, the show oh, you can Yeah, that is a big bathtub. I have an estimate. Okay. This is a very positive attitude. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. No, it's uh, as I say. Th this is, I think, is something to 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 think about. Um, it takes maybe a little while to to work through it, but uh, okay. Um, anybody has any questions? I'm open for. You can open your microphone and make any question. Now, see your space. Okay, we got very, very silent public as usual. Uh, yeah, as usual. Scaring even to lift one finger and say me. <laughs> Scared of. Que bon, Carmen. Anything to ask? Martin. No. Okay. Uh, well, it was only to say thank you to Gordon and. Uh, to ask you for the next meeting 
uh, is after summer, isn't it? Uh, yeah. The the next now the next meeting. Um, the idea was that I was going to I'm going to do um, I'm going to pr present the Enroad uh, Climate Interactive. Uh, that will be seventh or eighth of June. Okay. Let's on seventh. Let's put yeah, it on yeah. seventh. Okay. Okay. Um, it's now the format. The format it could be the same sort of format, but the thing is, the Enroad is something which is it's not mine. Um, but it's something which is I'm trying to let's say diffuse. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's uh, it, I think it's worth 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 looking at to play with. But if you don't know how to work with it, it's uh, it can look a bit formidable at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So my idea is to just try and sort of present it so that you can see it and then go away and, and use it yourself. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So okay. on seven, can we fix that uh, five o'clock Roman time instead of yeah. half past six? Yeah, that's so fine. We, we give more time to Italian teacher to join it because they will be okay. a little bit busy. Okay, that's fine. Okay, lovely. So and uh, what else? This is a, we, that one will be the last meeting until uh, September then. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, seven. 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 I'll, yeah. I'll just. I think I'll put it on the chat. Maybe. Yeah. You will. You will receive an email with all the information. Don't worry. We're going to prepare uh, an edit to the main program. Okay. Okay. Uh, Gordon, thank you very much. I think. Uh, well. It's really your uh, support. The teacher is really well appreciated. Uh, I hope I, I hope that this is useful in some way. Um, so the video will be uploaded tomorrow on the page, so you you'll be able to to see it and to show it and as many times. And one day we will ask to someone to translate it. International languages and have subtitles, <laughs> but <laughs> it would be an amazingly long <laughs> work. Yeah, I think so. Okay. okay. Anyway, thank you, Gordon. Okay, thank you, everybody, and thank see you soon. You. Okay, bye.